I never meant to own What you get it out for What you get it out for We die alone We'll all die young What you get it out for What you get it out from Snow glistening on the ledge Whiskey on the bed Shake it out and light a cigarette I miss me when I hear I know it ain't easy 
sheep of Israel and um, today we have a very special teaching that might don't seem too much to people but it is a lot and I still is um, meditating <clears throat> on what was was going on with um, within the Psalms class and just letting that brother know there's no need to know the name if he wasn't in the back so there's no reason for you to know the name of the brother <clears throat> but I just want to let that brother know again, because it's 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 um it's an irritation to to myself when when I know Satan chasing brothers like that, and I'm just letting you know, my brother. I'm making this openly known. We 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 on the field together. So the only way that something can walk away you have to walk away from him then you're walking away from all but long as you're in the fight you remember this from my own statement and my word I stand with you every step of the way I'm with you that's why I want to be connected to you to make sure you make it through all these parts all these landmines that he He's setting for you. But I'm with you. So you remember that, my brother. And same thing. You have my number. Your mom just sent me your number. So we're going to be talking. But remember one thing. I'm always with you, my brother. And we will stand together. So you're not going through this by yourself because I'm not going to let you. We're going we gonna to beat this thing. So... Anytime you reach out, just reach out. Just call me as if I'm one of your uncles or anybody. Just call me, just call me. And just lay it on me, whatever. And we're going to work it out. Also, we want to make a couple of announcements. That um, Brother Sampson, you might see him in there, Brother Kermit Sampson. He shows up. But I want everybody to understand, we, we welcome him now as a deacon. One of our new deacons here. And Brother Kermit Sampson. So he'll be helping us on the back end doing quite a few things. So we do want to welcome him there. And also, um, I'm going to make an announcement even later. But but right now, if you have not, you can actually get out and go over to um, gospelillustrated.com. It's no different than a Facebook. You can post your information there. You can post uh, what we're doing over with... Um, from Sinai to the day. We're doing some some gospel illustrated, meaning the message illustrated. We're sitting there seeing this here. But you can post, you know, pictures. You can do the same thing you do on Facebook. You can do the same thing here. And the same thing, you know, if you want to join there, it's free. All we need is your email to come in. But And that's it. That's all you really need. We're not looking for really much of anything. But you can see, you know, you can go in and you can see some of the people that's, you know, you can see them in there. You can go to different people and 
you know, that's Sister Little John here. She got people, she posts her clouds. But this is based on a project, so I know why she's doing this, but this is, dang, she found some pretty good stuff. But anyway, that's what's going on. So if you want to join it, it doesn't cost anything to join it. You just can go over there and gospelillustrated.com, go there. You can go in. No different than Facebook. You have statements you want to make. Because <clears throat> the same as um, mine, um, I did a little, I'm doing the same project. And the same thing is, you know, and, and same thing, somebody asked me this, and I just want to make sure this is clear. I talk a lot. So, so the same thing is, on my comment, um, read more. I wrote a lot of stuff here based on what was going on with this snail I took a picture of. I'm not asking you guys to do that. I just did that. So I'm not looking for you guys to do it. If you got something else to say, you just say it. But I'm not looking for uh, people to put stuff in there. You say whatever you want to say. But if you don't want to say anything, you don't say anything. It's just the same thing. But it's no different than a Facebook. But over here, we've been more protective, <clears throat> not based on what you're saying, because we're not going to monitor really what you say. But we will make sure people use names. We're not coming in under them, under these camp names. That we'll deal with on another subject. But hopefully, as I'm asking each and every person that joins it, you know, if you can, we're hoping that you guys won't be using profanity and stuff like that. Because we're not going to monitor it, but we're asking you, hopefully, that Gospel Illustrated is what it is. It's the message illustrated in things that you see. So if it's stuff that you want to share with people, you share it. You do the same thing. It's no difference. So hopefully you do that. But it's free to join. All you need is your email to get in. That's it. Not, not nothing big and special. But, well, thing we're dealing with. It's telling us. Unto the pure and I'm pure. This is something that um, we need people really to open up their mind, their heart, and really understand to where you can really dig in self. And one of the best things that happened, even today in the um, Psalms class, Elder Jenkins was 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 going through it. He's he's letting you know exactly what's going on, and it's it's actually just building on what he actually said. But we want to understand something here. We want to understand what is pure. What is pure? We got to understand that. So in the spiritual context, pure. It often refers to a state. A moral and spiritual spiritual integrity. Being free from sin, malice, or deceit, it suggests even more to align with the values, principles, and the laws that is ordained by God. Everybody get that. I just want to make sure everybody understands that as we're getting ready to go through this. So when we're looking at spiritual purity, spiritual purity means to harbor thoughts, express words, and perform actions that is consistent with spiritual righteousness. It entails having like a heart that's free from hatred, from jealousy, and from deceit. That's what it is. It's about being honest, forgiving, and compassionate, and loving towards the lifestyle that is set before us by Jehovah that came to be our guide. Spiritual purity. The Bible, the Bible says this, and we want to we want to start looking at some of that. In one second, I want to sit there and see. It looked like my Bible's are not showing correctly, so let me take care of something real quick. Let me see something. One second, one second. Now, I want to do this real quick. It looked like my Bibles wasn't showing right. I'm going to try it, but I don't think they're showing right. If so, yep, they're not showing right. Okay, so give me one second. One second, we can take care of that. One second, we'll take care of that. And then we will move forward to what I was saying. And... I don't know why it did that way. 
but now we we good. So based on what I was saying, in the Bible idea, I'm gonna highlight that where we're gonna look at something in Psalms. In Psalms, we're looking at 24, and we're gonna look at verse three. We're gonna start there, but we're gonna get into what pure is. And but we're gonna start right here at Psalms 24 and verse three. It says, who shall ascend into the hills, into the hill of the Lord, to the spirit of God? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean hands in a pure heart, who have not lift up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So now we see something. So we need to consider something. Uh, let me, let, let's look at something hypothetical. We're gonna do something hypothetical real quick. And the reason why I want you to see something, we're gonna, we're gonna call this guy, we're just gonna say John. We're just gonna use John. We're gonna use hypothetical, but John, let's place, many of us gonna place ourselves there. John, well-respected businessman in the community. John, he came, let's say, he came from a, a, a humble beginning. And as he was raised in a small town, as most of us, but ambitions led him to the big city where he, he climbed the corporate ladder swiftly and as he grew great in wealth, so did his pride. He started to take pride as a possession and status, constantly flaunting, he had flaunt his luxurious lifestyles on social medias. And showing off his wealth in public gatherings, his soul was lifted up unto vanity. And he, uh, he found himself worth not, the, the, the self-worth that was not the character in his relationship with God. But it was material wealth in this sotel status that he that he was into. So now John, the same guy John, or if you want to put yourself there, he he started overshadowing his moral compass. To maintain his status and wealth, he began resorting to dishonest means. He he, he manipulated contracts. He deceived his business partner. He lied to his employees to secure more profits. He swore deceitfully, breaking promises, and, and he used them false pretenses to further his interests. So in essence, John allowed vanity, vanity, to inflate his ego. This is what he did. So deceit tainted his actions. Rather than humbling himself before God in conducting his business with integrity, he allowed worldly desires to lead him astray. So this examples, this example, it, it mirrors the, the, the various accounts in the Bible where individuals led by pride and deceit face severe consequences behind that. So the best example we can look at, which, which always has come to mind, is Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel who lifted up, up his own heart in pride, and he ended up paying for that sincerely. So I'm talking about severely. It's still the same story with John, as many of us today. But this story is a cautionary tale that I just told you. It's a cautionary tale about the spiritual dangers of vanity and deceit that underlines the importance of humility, honesty, moral integrity, lead to spiritually a pure life. In the, in, when we're looking at it in the context of um, the New Testament, explaining the same thing, uh, pure, pure spiritually takes on a deeper meaning, but not just um, about observing the commandments, in a legalistic sense, but it's initializing them on one's heart and mind. It's about having pure intentions. Understand what I'm saying clearly. Pure intentions, authentic love for God and a sincere faith. It's illustrated here when we're looking at uh, Matthew 5 and 8. We'll see it there. 
It says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. They shall see God. You see what we're saying? They are the ones going to see God. It's like, it's like a, a glass of water. You take a glass of water and you set it on the table. This is what I want you to do. Everybody do this, not right now, but do this on your time. And what I want you to do is take a glass of water, pure glass of water. Just pour it in a cup. But you want to pour it in a glass cup. In this glass of water, you can see straight through it. But then I want you to be tear that glass of water by a mirror. A mirror. In the mirror, you I want you to look in the mirror also. You should see the glass, the cup, meaning this. You can see straight through the glass. You shouldn't even see yourself as the image in the mirror. That's what I'm saying. But when you see yourself, <laughs> you see something else. That's something else to be taught. Yeah, speak on that. So when you look in the mirror, you see all the impurities. But you look in the water, it's clear. This is showing you the difference of pure and unpure. If you can't see through yourself as clear as that glass of water, it's letting you know what you're in is impure. One of the main reasons when I, you see me always talk about many times, I talk about people taking selfies. People love taking selfies, thinking that's the most beautiful thing in the world. They've taken pictures of something that is 100% unpure. And they, and they think it's everything in the world. One of the main reasons we related our actions and our thoughts. So pure means acting out of love without any hidden motives or deceit, honesty in actions, love and thoughts and sincerity in faith. Think about that. It's about aligning our whole being, mind, heart and soul with virtues of truth, love, righteousness that reflects God's nature. It's there. Achieving spiritual purity is a journey. Achieving spiritual purity is a journey. It's a process, a personal, a spiritual growth. So where one learns, as I say all the time, <clears throat> through their experiences and relationships with God to become more like Christ in their thoughts and their words and their deeds. So pure intentions is key. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pure intentions is key in a pure heart. In the realm of spiritual purity, a pure heart and pure intentions carry profound significance. They serve as fertile soil. Let's look at it that way. This fertile soil where seeds of righteousness are, are sown, neutered. And eventually they'll start bearing fruit of spiritual growth. This is what we want to dive into understand. These Yehovah points, points out to us that where well, we can be better. So when we look at that in Matthew chapter five and verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's telling us a lot. It represents this, this pure state, this spiritual state of being free from contamination and evil intentions. The heart is not divided, but solely committed to righteousness. Just as a microscope needs to be clean on the lens to see these objects clearly. So a pure heart allows us to see God. Actually, it's right here where we need to see. In John chapter 6, verse 46, it tells us, it says, not all, not that any man have seen the Father, save meaning only he that is of God, he has seen the Father. Wow. We must understand that. To understand his will, we have to perceive his divine presence and live, which draws us close to God. It draws us closer to God. 
it tells us the same thing when we looking at this and we want to look at everything as a whole it, it's saying draw nigh to god and he will draw nigh to you this is in james chapter 4 verse 8 it's telling us this cleanse your hands same thing cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double-minded ye double-minded This aligns with a person that is walking in two directions at once. <laughs> you already know that's an impossible thing for us to do. But that's what devil minded. That's saying we're walking in two directions at one time. And, and, and in the book of James, it's telling us, it's, it's urging us to purify our hearts and eliminate these, these, this spiritual deceitfulness. We have to, we have this undivided loyalty. We have to have this to God. Excuse me. This is what it is. The essence of pure intentions acting with complete sincerity and a whole heart and dedication to God's will. This is what we need to be doing. Ooh, excuse me. So after we can acknowledge this and his death and acknowledging the death and our transgressions, we, we can find out a little bit more about what God is seeking for us really to do. What he really want us to do. That's what we have to pay attention to. Not sitting there doing things with, with other people saying. So the depth of this in, 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 in the depth of our own transgression, the important of fostering undivided loyalty to God, we can further deepen our understanding by turning to understanding light. Right here in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10, it tells us clearly, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, you see how he's saying this. This is where King David, a man after God's own heart, made a sincere plea to the Lord. A sincere plea to the Lord. His cry was to create in me, to, to create in him a clean heart, a renewed and right spirit within him. See, this captures everything. This captures the essence of seeking spiritual purity. This verse shows David was not merely asking for forgiveness, but he was seeking transformation. Extends beyond the surface. Reaching into the innermost. The innermost parts of his body. One second. This is what David did. His plea was to the Lord for that. Creating me a clean heart and renew the spirit within me. A pure heart from sin, the spirit that is lying more with God's righteousness. Like David, our plea should be for a complete inward renewal that realigns our, our hearts, our spirit with God's will. Creating in us a pure intentions as a steadfast commitment in serving God, undivided loyalty. By doing so, we can take another critical step towards spiritual purity, navigating away from, navigating away from double-minded state of moving closer to sincere, wholehearted devotion to God. By aspiring to a level of purity, we can, we can echo David, David's plea. We can see it there. We can echo that. Inviting God to cleanse our hearts, renew our spirits, and guide us along the path of righteousness. The spiritual journey is not easy. But by diligently seeking God's wisdom and guidance, we can overcome our, our transgression, fostering a pure heart. It embodies a pure intention which God desires from each and every one of us. It's not crazy, is it? making a lot more sense. But these are the things we must do. These are things we must do, not should do. These are things we must do if we want to see God. <sighs> Imagine someone engaged in charity work. What do you think about that? 
Now just imagine someone engaged in volunteer in, in charity work. I want, you, I want you to truly think about this. Close your eyes and just listen to what I'm saying. And the reason why I want you to sit there and think about this, <clears throat> if they do purity out of, out of love and compassion, not expecting any recognition in return, they are demonstrating pure intentions and a pure heart. See, this aligns with Paul said. That's why I was going here to sit down. I just wanted to show you. It says in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, it says, And though I bestow all my good, all my good and feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I have not charity. It profit me nothing. It profit me nothing. Think about that. The reason why the reason why I want you to see this. Paul makes it clear that actions, even charitable ones, are meaningless without pure or purity of heart or its intent. Charity or love should hold should should should, should motivate them. Just the charity and love should already motivate them. So a pure heart and pure intentions involved of, of acting out of sincerity and love deepens our commitment and righteousness. This, this, this embodiment, the spiritual integrity, our thoughts, our words, our deeds are aligned with God's will and commandments. And then we strive to cultivate such purity in our lives and we draw closer to God with our spiritual vision and it becomes a little bit more clearer. So we got to see this, but I want to show you it has a bad side to this because this is what people do. This is what people do. And I don't need to show you this because some people, some people do it for reasons, do it for other reasons. And they're using this spiritual measure of giving that is not found in the quality or the quantity of the gift or public recognition, because that's what they're going to do it for. But the spiritual, but the pure intentions and the quality of heart, which it should do. See, Yahweh or Jesus, he, he, he makes this clear here. He, he making something clear that I want you to see. Right here. And um, we're going to go here to Matthew. I want to show you this in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start at verse 1. And I want you to really take this to heart. It says, Take heed that ye do not your arms. This is not money. These are good deeds. Arms has been lied to you about the saying it's money. And that's not the truth. Arms is good deeds. So it says, do not your good deeds before men to be seen of them. So don't do them just to be seen of them saying, look at what I'm doing. Otherwise, ye have no reward. Not from not from the father. You're not because you're getting it from people of your father. So not no reward of your father, which is in heaven. You're not going to get one from him because you're getting it from them. Let's look at verse two speaks more. He says, for that reason, when I do thy good deeds. So when you do your good deeds, do not sound a trumpet before them in the presence of them. Don't do that. Don't do that. When you do that, and you, this is the same thing that you end up doing, you sound in this trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. And in the streets that they may have glory of men, verily I say, unto, I say unto you, they have their reward. They just got it. I'm going to show you an example of that. I want to show you a pure example of this. But when thou doeth arms, so when you do your good deeds, don't let not the left hand know what the right hand doeth. No reason to ring your bell. No reason to tell nobody about it. No reason to sit there to do these things. Don't do this at all. This is what going on. This is what happens. 
So when you do this, you, you make sure you understand what's going on. And the same thing is this. In um, one second, that every that every Israel uh, can somebody just boot him out. He can go somewhere where somebody can, he can hear. Just just re, just hide him from the channel. Just that simple. Uh, but when we're looking at verse four, and we'll make sure this is clear. Because if not, I'm a, one second. Let me, they, 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 they missing it. Let me, let me remove it myself. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he's hidden from the channel. So, so this is the main thing. It says, that thy arms may be in secret. And when thy father seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. This is clear. This is being very clear to us right now. And we got to see things, but you see this is contrary on what people do. This is why I say I want to show you an example of people do this. They want everybody to know what they're doing, but then they want to get the glory and everything of people. It's not getting, becoming a God, but it's becoming from people. So let me show you this example of what I'm talking about. This is my class, 2019. I know my class will make sure they pay this forward. This is the $40 million moment no one saw coming. On behalf of the eight generations of my family who have been in this country, we're gonna put a little fuel in your bus. My family is making a grant to eliminate their student loans. Billionaire Robert F. Smith surprised the graduating class at Morehouse College Sunday with a mountain of generosity, promising to pay off the college debt of every student. There's nearly 400 in the class. <laughs> Students, faculty, they couldn't believe their ears. The look on this man's face says everything. Parents were overjoyed. I asked the person to the left of me, I asked the person to the right of me, the person in front of me, the person in back of me, is this really what he said? Gerard Graduates Gerard jumped to their feet and had even more reason to dance across the stage while accepting their diplomas. Everybody, these are my girls. Oprah is giving 150 South African girls a chance for a brighter future. Her school for girls opened in Africa, fulfilling a long cherished dream and a promise to Nelson Mandela. This has been a long time coming. This is not just for me. Um, you know, some small idea. This is a supreme moment of destiny for me. I've been coming to this day my entire life. The school will be known as the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls. It is located south of Johannesburg. I believe that education is an open door to all life, a sustainable bridge to all that is possible. Education is my bridge to self-esteem. Former President Mandela was among the guests at the opening ceremony. Tina Turner, Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, Chris Tucker, and Spike Lee also attended the event. You know, everything Oprah does is next level. She's uh, just one of those anointed people who can change the world, and um, we don't have very many of those people left. Winfrey claimed that educating young girls will help in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And because AIDS is a pandemic in this country, I, begin, I believe that we have to begin to change the pandemic by education. Would, would you come tell what the Lord told you? Uh, God bless you. It's called me a little off guard, Bishop. A, a, a couple of, uh, what was it, three or four days ago? Three or four days ago, I, I called. I was at Manpower. And um, being blessed. Wrote my check out. I said, you know, I, I didn't have my checkbook when I got to Pastor White's. Uh, when I got to a, a woman that I lose tonight before, and Pastor White said, you know, write a check for $113,000, for those of you who can. Write a, write a check for $113 for Psalms 113. And I wrote a check for $113,000. And I admit, <clears throat> my intention was to just leave the check and bless God. Because, see, I love to give. I've been a giver all my life. And when people have given to you, 
and sown into you and God has touched them and given given you favor because see when you have favor with come on somebody see they don't understand it where I come from they don't understand it in Hollywood but I'm going to tell you something about the blood of Jesus all of my life you know my mother she didn't have much to give me she didn't have millions of dollars she didn't have some legacy but she had Jesus and she taught me about that God so I didn't even know that he was he was trying to build this youth center I didn't even know it but I know how important the youth are so we were sitting in the service and I leaned up toward him and I said I've just been touched to give a million dollars so as So when you got up here and you said a million dollars, I said, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know I heard your voice. Hey! I'm going to tell you right now, when you hear the voice of God, you move. Don't worry about what nobody says to you. Don't worry about what it looks like. Don't worry about your enemy. Don't worry about your hater. He will bless you. He will lift you. He will give you. So again, as he's talking about with this money that he gave, we have to understand what he what he's saying here. See, because God will bless you, but he's going to bless you with wealth that comes from heaven, not with temporal things that is here on earth. So he would have blessed him with the knowledge. So letting you know, he, but they each one letting you know what they gave, how they gave, as he did. He's telling you how much he gave. He wants you to know exactly. And that's why people look. He, he didn't make a mistake when he said $113,000 the first time. He didn't make that mistake. He said that on purpose to let you know what kind of what kind of dollars he's dropped in there. Then he said, well, no, he he said a check for 113. I just wrote a check for 113,000. But then I wrote another check for 1 million. So these we have to look at these words, these these are words of 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 their arms. They're good deeds. It refers to good acts and deeds and kindness. But but the same thing is you see Yahweh Shai criticized that. He criticized it. He said, he, he's telling you right up here, right up, made it clear up here. Therefore, when I do with the arms, do not sound the trumpet as they do in the synagogue. Same, they in a synagogue. They're, they're in a gathering building. So they're in a synagogue. Don't do that. But you see, they, you just see the, the perfect exhibit of that. When they do their charitable, they charitable deeds. They want the glory of men. People sitting there looking at, man, he gave this. But man, look what he did. Dang, dude, he gave a million. Wow, this, this is what they look for. Their reward is fleeing admiration and applause of people, what we just seen, and doing approval of God. True giving, as Yahweh said, or Jesus emphasizes, is done discreetly without seeking public attention or recognition. It's like planting the seed beneath soil. It's unseen. When you plant that seed beneath soil, it's unseen by all people, by all others. But it's neutered by God. And then who sees it and then ensures it a blossom and bear fruit. So when you put that seed in the ground, nobody knows that seed is there but you. But God's seen it. And as it's being neutered and everything else, all of a sudden this becomes a tree. So we have to consider people who call themselves philanthropists, who make these grand donations as what we've seen there. It's not out of genuine compassion or the sense of a duty, but it's a tax write-off. So we have to understand what's going on behind it. It's a tax write-off. It's a public acclaim to where they can have their names inscribed on buildings. That's what you've seen with Oprah did and why she did it in Africa. She did it for those specific reasons. Their actions might seem commendable to the world, but spiritually, their intentions are not pure. 
the rewards are earthly and temporal, not heavenly. Meaning, meaning this, it aligns with buying a ticket to a show. You buying a ticket to a show. Once the show is over, that ticket that you just purchased holds no value. Keep it that way. That's the easiest way to do it. You bought a ticket for the three o'clock show. Once the show is over, that ticket that you purchased for the three o'clock show and you've seen it, that ticket now has no value. So actually, other other hand, you can imagine the same thing what we're looking at with uh, Matthew. It says the same thing. It says they have not recognition, but they're moved by compassion and love. So they don't they don't trumpet their deeds on social media like seeking accolades. In the essence, when you see Matthew chapter six, their deeds is like candles that burn quietly. That's what it should be. The act of giving and spiritual being meaningful and pure, we must spring from the heart. God looks on that on that love from the heart, the compassion, not desires for public recognition or material gain. Yahweh Shai teaches us such sincerity to humble giving is done in secret. And that's seen by God. And he rewards you openly. So this essence of giving with a pure heart, with pure intentions. So when we add it onto this, we're looking at this, while charitable giving, don't get that wrong, charitable giving is commendable in a lot of things. But the spiritual significance of acting in that, it lies with the intentions that really is behind it. So when we're looking at many high profile figures, such as your Oprah Winfrey's, your Tyler Perry's, that Robert Smith, and among others, who make generous public donations. These acts of generosity come from within the public and many times for, would take, it brings media and acknowledgement leading to hero worship and recognition. Hero worship and recognition, <clears throat> which encapsulate the same thing in, in this right here. Take heed, do not <clears throat> do uh, do not your arms before men. It it encapsulate this. It encapsulate this entirely. Otherwise, they have no reward of your father. When you done let every the world know what you done did, that was your reward right there. So his million dollar fame was right there. When these acts and deeds are performed in the public and praise recognition, they lose their spiritual reward. I don't care how you look at it, how you flip it, how you script it. It is not to say like public philanthropism is inherently wrong. Now, I'm not saying that, but in fact, to inspire, because they do it, to inspire other people to give, to do something to that. Spiritual standpoint, spiritual purity intentions, the genuine desire to help, expecting nothing in return. And so when you look in that mirror, is why I said this early on. So when you look in the mirror, you don't see Tyler Perry. You don't see Oprah Winfrey. You don't see Robert Smith. You don't see Michael Johnson. You don't see John. You don't see Jan. You don't see none of these people. You see nothing. You like a win. You like a you got like a wind in the air. It's not seen. It just happens. What made that leaf move? Just the wind blew by. It just happens. You don't know where that wind came from. You don't know where that wind's ending up. It just happens. But some people want to know. They want you to know where that came from. So the act of giving should not be a transactional or as conducting business event, inspecting accolades, honor, or recognition in return. It should be spiritually transformative or act to give out of love, compassion, and sense of duty, inspecting nothing back or honor or recognition, period. So even us as followers of Christ, we should strive to be selfless, discreetly, as Christ himself taught. Our left hand should not know what our right hand is doing and vice versa. 
when we do our good deeds this way, our Father who sees everything in secret, He rewards you openly. Such giving reflects purity. Pure heart and intentions are spiritual rewarding. And let me let me let me let me give you another scenario. Give you something about something. Let's let's look at something. If if you look at a you had a charismatic individual, could be many of us. Charismatic individual in the community that's faced with a water crisis in their community. They claim they possess a special way to process and to do something with a solution that's capable, that's turning a contaminated water source into pure portable water. This individual, however, he's not a trained scientist, nor is a water purification expert. They are simply using their influence, their charisma, to convince people to drink unclean water treated with his process. Consequently, many are going to fall ill due to the waterborne diseases that is in the water. The same person knowingly or even unknowingly spreads this falsehood, causing harm to those who actually trust in following him or sometimes her. On a on a, on a, on another plane, we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. On another plane, consider a charismatic charismatic preacher who emerges within a community of seekers. I care less who he is. You can even say you could you can put me in the boat right along with it. But we want to look at it what it, for what the truth is. They can articulate. Compelling sermons, they can they 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 claim to have unique spiritual insight and they can sway masses with their charisma. However, the preacher distorts the teachings of scriptures. He distorts it. Introducing their own interpretations and they diverge significantly from the truth. Their doctrine aligns with impure. The same thing with water theory, with that previous example. It's contaminated with falsehoods and misconceptions. So those who consume imperfect doctrine, impure doctrine, suffering spiritually, their spiritual growth will be hindered and their relationship with God distorted. So I'm going to ask you the question that you ask within yourself. Which was worse? Drinking the unpure water or consuming false doctrine? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm gonna get you. Uh, let's let, let's 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 do something. Let's do something. Why you why you thinking on that? We're gonna look at Matthew chapter 16. Why are you thinking on that? Um, let's go over here. Why are you thinking on that? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna lasso this horse because. Which one is worse, drinking an impure water, consuming false doctrine? In Yahweh, he tells us, he's telling. He says, "Then Yahweh, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of leaven. Leaven. Keep that in mind. Write that down because we're gonna find out what leaven is. It says of the Pharisees, leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You see how this is going? This this not going too good." So we need to we need to build on that. We need to build on that. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, we're going to tie all three of them together. We're going to look at 16, verse 12. And we understand the same thing. Matthew 16, 12 says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You see how this is going now. You see how this went. This is why it's so important. I, I say it all the time. You got many of the other elders tell you all the time. Watch who you learn from. Because we have many people 
who, 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 who go upon reflection and disciples being understood and against the warnings of doctrines and religion of these leaders. And they taught these traditions of men and commandments of men and, and they teaching them against the doctrines of God. So they taught by men as if they was God's commandments and they were not. People leading people astray in their flawed interpretations. These spiritual consequences, consuming false doctrine, they can be more detrimental than physical effects of drinking contaminated water. Think about that. Something to think about. And, and as we think about that, uh, put some little bit more on your head. And we need to think about more about this. In, in Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 23. Elaborate a little, little bit more. Actually, I already have it. it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Wow. Yeah. While the body may recover from physical ailments, a spiritual heart. So you can recover from that contaminated water that you drunk physically different thing if you were spiritually led astray it takes much longer and you have more burdensome on the path that they took you to get back the truth into the light so while the consuming of physical and pure water is detrimental to one's physical health but then you take false doctrine one can have more damaging lasting impact on your spiritual well-being so therefore, it's critical to exercise discernment in both physical and spiritual consumption, spiritual and seeking, seeking purity in all aspects of your lives. So the same as it's saying in the Bible, as it's telling you, when we look at that, where he started talking about leaven, Yahweh Shai or Jesus, he's talking about leaven. It carries this metaphorical or this similitude, this spiritual meaning, which is a substance like yeast. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what it means, but it's a substance like yeast that causes dough to rise. I want you to understand exactly what it's doing. It's causing dough to rise as frequently used as a symbol of influence. Specifically in pervasive influence of sin and false doctrine, as we see in Matthew chapter six. And we go to verse six. Actually, one second. Let me let me go to Matthew six. And I want um, 16, 6. That's the one I want. I don't know what I'm looking at. There we go. Here. It says, And when Yahweh shall said unto them, Take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. That's why he's saying this. That was the point of that. See, this is, this is, this is a metaphorical term or a similitude term on what he uses the disciple because this is harmful spiritual influences in Pharisees and Sadducees, what they do, teaching lies, deceit, hypocrisy, which was a distortion from God's truth and his laws and, and the principles and, and understanding them. This is actually another biblical, um, another understanding we can pull. And we're going we're gonna to run these in 1 Corinthians. We'll see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, same thing, verse 6. And you see the same identical thing. It says, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? You, you, did you catch that? Just a little? And it says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, even for even Christ, our Passover, which he should have went to the other side, is sacrifice for us. So the same is what people do. They still hold on to leaven. People say, they tell you all the time, well, I learned this, I learned this in the church and it was still good. Okay, you still keep it. Don't matter what, that's still leaven. I don't care how you look at it, how you flip it. These instances of leaven is symbolic of corrupting influences even to the smallest amount, they can permeate the influence of the whole body of belief or behavior. Much like a small amount of yeast, as he's telling you, it can cause the entire lump of the dough to rise. 
such as Levin often serve as a caution against the, 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 the subtle pervasive influence of sin and false teachings. So you can sit there and say you were sitting in this church for all this time and I done learned some good out of there. No, you throw all that away because all of it was leaven. They had leaven in it. So you throw it all away. Because if you keep it, it's going to always rise up at one point, a time or another. And you can easily see it. Anybody who tell you they keep what they learn in a church, they keep it. I want you to, I want you to, you can even, you can see it. People say, well, I did this in church. Well, I did this. This was good that I did in the church. All you got to do, observe them. Don't do, don't do anything else. Just observe them. I guarantee you they can sit there and they can say they humble as a, as a pie right now. You're going to see one of those days as you observing them, you're going to see their dough rise. It's going to happen. You can't, you can't get around it. It's going to happen. Why? Because they kept the leaven that was in the church that they said that they learned that was still good. A little leaven, and if it's mixed, you throw away the entire dough. You can get rid of all of it. So the leaven has the capacity to affect larger mass despite no matter how small the quantity is. So it mirrors seemingly to where it is show a deviation of truth that can profoundly impact our spiritual well-being. And they use this, this distorted doctrine, these misinterpretations of scripture, and is incorporated into this non-biblical element that leads you astray from the path of righteousness and purity. Just as that little tiny lump of leaven is leaven at the entire batch, no matter what you learn in that church from anyone. If you kept one little smidget of it, you're going to be leavening it the entire lump that you have. That's why that's one of the reasons I say a lot of people is here. Everybody's not going to the kingdom. Because you're going to keep some little leaven that you done got from somewhere else thinking that at least this was good. And you done leaven it the whole lump. Which brings us right here. I want to show you something. Um, we'll look at this in, in Titus. We're going to find something. Titus chapter 1, we're going to start it right there at verse 15. Same thing. What, what the basis of the teaching is. It says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. But he says a little bit more. They confess and they confess they know God. That's a full thought there. They're going to confess they know God. But in works, they deny him. What, what are you telling? All you got to do is watch them. Watch them. You're going to see. They're going to do contrary. It's not for you to check them on it. You just watch them. They're going to do contrary. Because they're going to sit there and say, I learned this. Well, I learned this out of church, and I know this is good, so I'm going to keep this, but I'm, I ain't going to throw that. No. You throw everything away. You throw everything away. But if you keep it, don't worry. You might well sit down. I don't even know why you I don't even know why you're here. That's what that's what I tell you. I don't even know why you're here. Because you're keeping something that you shouldn't even have. So the same thing is he's telling you here. You're going to profess you know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. We, we're going to tear some of this down. See, this past contrasts with Paul's perspective of these two types of individuals. These two types of individuals we want to understand. Pure and defile. Pure and defile. Spiritually, it refers to being free from corruption and sin. Having a heart to seek and cherish the truth of God's word. Such as individuals, they, they, perceive, they perceive purity in all things. And it, as their hearts and their minds, they align with God's righteousness. But on the other hand, on the other hand, yeah, those who are defiled. They allowed the leaven or they didn't kept piece of just a piece, a piece. They, they think they think they took off a piece of that dough 
that is not leaven because it was true, they kept that piece of it, it was still false doctrine. Disobedient, disbelief permeates in their hearts and their minds. Their spiritual perception is tainted. I don't care how you look at it, how you flip it, how you script it. It's tainted. And then things they're going to profess to be pure. And they really unpure. These individuals, they claim to know God. But in their actions, they speak otherwise. They deny him through their deeds. Even in the terms abominable, reprobate, as it's telling right there in verse 16, telling us. They claim they know God, but they being abominable and disobedient. Every good work, reprobate. Every good work, reprobate. Think about that. How are these things true like that? I'm telling you, this carries a heavy spiritual connotation about doing these abominable works, often referred to anything morally detestable or profoundly odd with God's character and his laws, while reprobate refers to an individual who are morally corrupt and rejected by God due to their refusal to accept his truth. These are things we have to, no matter what, be aware of and understand. In uh, Jeremiah 24, 24 and 7, we're going to get some clarification. We need some clarification. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. He's the spirit of God. <clears throat> Being real clear. Here. And they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Not a little, not even a, if anybody got a stick pen, put a stick pen in a piece of paper. You can't even have that much leaven in there. <clears throat> That much leaven can't even be in there. So when you get a stick pen, just, 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 just stick it in something, it can't have that much leaven in your heart. That's the point. Not even that. In a stick pen, you're going to see it's just a small stick. You can't have that much in your heart. You got to come back with the whole heart. He don't want not one stick of leaven in it. So when we consider this verse, we, we got to provide and what he does. This verse also provides us the blueprint to achieve in spiritual purity, a dedicated whole heart pursuant to God, a whole heart pursuant to God. So this contrast and being defiled, it represents like, like the Pharisees as we seen earlier. Same thing, we go back in Matthew and we're gonna look at verse 23, verse 27. And it's telling you, right up front to where we can understand, it says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Ye are like unto white sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inwardly you're full of dead man bones and of uncleanness. Outside you're gorgeous. Outside you, you 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 dressed in high end clothing. You look good. Nails done, toes done, everything. You look good. But inside, once we get inside, oh, you got a bunch of dead people with bones in there. So we need to avoid spiritual defilement. We got to guard against leaven, false doctrine. Because if not, you're going to be in that closet where them dead men bones are. Focusing on the developing our whole and pure hearts and seek God's truth above all else. It's, it's what it is. Because if you're sitting there, you're sitting with this charismatic person telling you all these bold faith, un, un, unadulterated lies, you thinking you good. But he putting you in his closet. So when God opened it up, your bones are in his closet. And he going to toss the whole thing. 
So we need to avoid spiritual defilement. We must guard against leaven, false doctrine, focusing on developing a pure heart, seek God's truth above all else, which leads us to live in alignment with God's will, reflecting genuine faith through our actions rather than empty professions of belief. Everybody with me? So we need to understand these things. We need to clearly understand these things. So people will come up and then you're going to come up with the question. People are going to sit there. I need to understand something there. Then how can I, you know, how can we, how can each and every one, how can my and my children, how can me and my husband, how can me and my wife, then how can we discern between pure doctrine and defound doctrine, then defiled doctrine? We need to understand how we can discern between the two. Viable question. Because that's going to come up. Viable question. I get it. You, you, they sit there and they can ask. That many people come to a pre- How can we discern if you, if you, if you is giving me pure doctrine or you giving me defiled doctrine? You point that to me. See, don't look at nobody. Okay, Elder Johnson, how can we know and discern if you're giving us pure doctrine or defiled doctrine? What biblical tools and principles can help us discern between pure and defiled doctrine? The essential task of everyone pursuing the path of righteousness, the guide of discernment, the Bible provides seven principles. To communicate through precepts. Commandments that help us shape our understanding, our behavior. So we need to explore those principles. 100%. Understand something. When you're looking at this. And you go through it. And you see some of this. In Isaiah. Um, Isaiah chapter 28. We're going to look at verse 10. It's already highlighted. It's telling us right here, right up front. And watch how it tells you. It says, for precept must, command it, be upon precept. Precept upon precept, full of thought, line upon line, line upon line, full of thought, here a little, there a little. Wow. So for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This reinforces the idea that understanding comes from examining all scripture. Not just isolated passages. This this reflects in the nature of biblical understanding and spiritual growth. Spiritual wisdom do, do not come in a rush and bound, and, 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 but it builds slowly. You got people out there talking about you can learn the Bible in 12 weeks. They got 12 week courses out there. Caps do that. Stupidity. This here reflects in the nature of biblical understanding. Spiritual growth. Piece by piece, precept upon precept, line upon line. So the term when we look in that precept, we know is understood to be a commandment or a divine rule of conduct. Line is considered to be spiritual. Spiritually, the path or direction of the verse and is repeating the phrase here little, there little shows the progressive revelation of God's truth across the path of the the path of scripture that we need to do. It's clear. Clear. How do you say it? Crystal. (laughs) It's crystal. So this principle is echoed as we'll see. This principle is echoed. And we want to understand that. We want to understand this. And um, we're going to look at some of this. We're going to see something. Proverbs chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 18. And then notice, sweetie. Hey, that's noted. No problem. I just looked up and that's noted. No issues. <laughs> okay. So it's telling us. Right here. It says in Proverbs chapter four in verse 18, it's clear. It says, but the path of the just 
is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. Unto a perfect day. I want you to think about that. See, this speaks of the progressive nature of understanding righteousness that, that dawns on the brightening more and more until the day is full of light. It's progressive. And it's going to keep getting brighter and brighter. If you ever, <clears throat> if you ever take the time and um, you don't have to do it with the kids, but if the kids get up early, then you do it with the kids. Get up with the kids before the sun come up and just sit somewhere and, and, and just where they can see the sun. It progressively come up and then it's going to just progressively show more and more and more light, more and more light, more and more. And then it's going to be full to where everywhere you can look north, east or south. Light is there. I'm saying that to, 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 to lead you somewhere, but, but we're going to look at this. In John, in John chapter uh, 16 and verse 12, I'm saying that to lead you somewhere. And he says this. The reason why we're getting into progressive, that's why I was leading you there. It says, I, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. I will lead you to this. The reason why, because even, even this tells us our capacity to understand spiritual truth. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Because this is this right here, what Yahweh Jesus is saying, he's given us commentary to the understanding of the principle that will reflect it to him. But we got to understand what this is coming from. This tells us our capacity to understand spiritual truth. It grows over time. It grows over time. And God reveals these truths. So, 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 so to us, when we really able to receive them and we can really hold on to them, this is why people, I used to get it. I still get it. But, but the main thing is I still understand it. And it's not a, it's, it's not a disrespect to me. But, uh, but people sit there and they, people didn't understand me. They didn't, they, man, I don't know what in the hell you're talking about. It was like I was talking Chinese to them. I'm done. You got many people. My, my brother and them, my mother and them used to tell me the same stuff. They ain't do you like you talking Chinese to us. This is why some people don't understand me now thinking I'm speaking another language, but learning according to the spirit of God and according to the precepts that God gives you, you're going to start learning, understanding. This approach also underscores the, 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 the importance of careful. It consists of study. It consistent of study. In fact, uh, it builds on this, and we want to look at that real close. In 2 Timothy, we want to take a closer look at that, what we're talking about. In 2 Timothy, we're going to look at chapter 3 in verse 16. The reason why I want you to really clearly get where he's coming from. And Paul, Paul explains a lot of this for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, including is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions, and righteousness. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. So the same thing is when we're looking at this, we want to look at the uh, same thing in verse 17. It says that the man of God may be perfect so that you man, M-A-N. So that's not just honed in on men, but it's man, M-A-N, which is talking about man or woman. So that this person of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works unto all good works. So when you're looking at this as a whole, when we were just here in Isaiah chapter 28 in verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, it makes it more clear. This is a reminder to understand that God's word is a gradual process and it requires patience, dedication, and the spirit willing to be guided by God's truth. So it's a journey of discovery. That's what we're actually doing over there with, with Gospel Illustrated. This is a process. This is a journey of discovery. And every step builds upon the previous. Every step draws you closer to the hearts of God's message. 
That's the beauty of this. So we need to do that and also have the wisdom to understand what God is saying. We have to, because if not, we, we're wasting our time. In Proverbs chapter 2, looking at verse 2, we're going to build this up. We're going to look at this a little bit, little bit closer. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2, we'll start right there. Right there is a beautiful part to build on this. It says, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Wow. I'm talking about this. Let's read. Let's read down to six and we, we're going to come back. We're going we're gonna to visit all of it. It says, yea, if thou criest after knowledge. So if you cry in after knowledge. And lift up thy voice for understanding, providing if thou seeketh her, meaning the spirit of God as silver, as a woman, you see, I, I love the way they switches this. It's beautiful the way they switch it. Because if you seek it, the spirit of God as a woman, it searches for her for hidden, as for hidden treasure. See, this is what, I'm, beautiful the way they're putting it. I'm t- gorgeous. It says, then, Thou shalt understand the fear, the desire of the Spirit of God, the Lord, and find if knowledge of God. <laughs> so let's tear some of this down, because I'm telling you, it's gorgeous the way of saying it. So all he's saying is, is this, if you seeketh her as silver. So all you guys, y'all know, we, 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 don't, we talking to dudes. We talking to God. We ain't talking to no homosexual. No, we ain't talking to no homosexual. We talking to men. And I want you to understand this. All the men that are married. Men that are married, you have a fiance or you or you have a girlfriend. What he's saying is this. He says, if, in verse four, he's telling you right here, if providing thou seek of her. So what he's saying is this. If you seeking this girl, this woman, This is how you're going to be doing it. Her, if you're going to seek the spirit of God as silver, as this woman, and search it for the spirit of God as for hidden treasure, then thou shalt understand the, the desire of the, of the spirit of God. The same way you say, I, oh, I, got, I got to have it. <laughs> same thing I used to I'd sit there, you see guys say, they sit there, hey girl, how you doing? She, I'm doing okay. I know you ain't you ain't tired. Tired. Jeez, I've been chasing you all night. I'm talking about dudes, they're gonna be relentless when they really want a woman. They are gonna be relentless. They're not going to stop until until you tell him, don't bother, I'm gonna call the cops and just leave me alone. But if he really wants you. And you might say that I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna let him chase me for a while. He, you know, he ain't. You ain't. You ain't told that man nothing. You ain't told him nothing. That's a lion sitting there hunting in the bush. You ain't even told that man nothing. Yeah, I'm. Oh, I'm gonna get you. Okay. Uh huh. Then all of a sudden he he hit that he hit that good spot. Oh, uh, you wanna go to dinner? Or this you going to dinner? Oh. We're going to go stag? Oh, no. We ain't going stag. Mm-mm. I asked you out. Mm-mm. Sit there, order whatever you want. Dang, this is... He said, uh-huh, uh-huh. I tell you what you do. I tell you what some people do. Hey, can I bring my friend? Because you got now you got these crazy dudes out there. So some people say, bring your friend. Bring them on. He said, yeah, well, well, I pay for it. No, mm-mm, 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 I got you. Said, oh, dang. Now she's telling her, girl, he just went to the bathroom. Girl, girl, you don't want him, you let me know. I take him. Girl, you, you don't want him. Act like you don't want him. I want him. I'm telling you, men know what I'm talking about. Y'all might don't know, but men know what I'm talking about. Men know exactly what I'm talking about. They'll sit there and they, boy, 
And that girl sitting there, like, shoot, I shouldn't even brought my friend. No, you shouldn't have. But guess what? It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. But they're going to catch it. So the same thing in verse 6. The same thing when we're going to look at this in verse 6. You're going to see it right here. It says, For the Spirit of God giveth wisdom. Out of the mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Oh, yeah. So that we incline our ear unto wisdom. We apply our heart to understanding. This is a vivid illustration in an earnest pursuit of wisdom and understanding. It is eloquating that this intense quest for silver, this woman or spirit, this hidden treasure, this is a hidden treasure. It emphasizes this active seeking, a deep longing, yearning for wisdom and understanding in the biblical context of what this Bible is, often signify this deep, intimate knowledge of God in his ways. So we have to, we have to incline our ear to wisdom. We, we listen. We, we, we got our ears to the ground. Where, where, where baby girl at? Where baby girl at today? Let me put my ear to the ground. <laughs> you want to know what's going on? The same way we should be chasing the Spirit of God. The same exact way. Let's look at something, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll build on this. In uh, James, we'll look at James uh, chapter 1, verse 19. James 1 and 19, is, it tells us this. And we'll see, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man, man or woman, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Every one of us. M-A-N, man or woman. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So we incline our ears to wisdom, indicate this conscious effort to where we can listen and be receptive to wisdom. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Not a bad thing. In, in, in building even on that, we look at it even more. In Jeremiah, and then we see this in verse 29. Chapter 29, we're going to pick it up over here at, um, at verse 13. Saying the same thing, watch how he's saying it. Is it and ye shall seek me. Oh, yeah. you going you, you looking for you looking for Ye You should seek me. Oh, I told you. If you're going to be relentless as seeking your wife or that girlfriend that you have or your fiance that you have, is that you're going to seek me. Oh, you're going to find me. <laughs> You'll find me. If you want me, you're going to find me. And ye shall search for me with all your heart. I mean, I'm going to find you. I got you, girl. You're going after her. This is, this, is what, this is clearly what he's letting us know. So the same thing is when we lift it up our voice and we sit in this and we, we persistent. We earnest in our prayers. It's reminiscent of this right here. It's reminiscent of this. The promise that follows this earnest profound to where we can now understand the fear of the Lord. We can find in the knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the central and it's the biblical part of what we need to do. It's the central theme of everything. The central theme of everything. In fact, um, we'll go back here. I want to show you something back in private. Actually, I can use this over here. In uh, Proverbs, I want to show you something. In Proverbs chapter 9, I'm going to go over here and I want to show you something a little bit more. Chapter 9, but we're going to pick it up in verse 10. And you see that it says, the fear, so it's telling us the desire of the Spirit of God, the, the desire of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the knowledge of the separated is is understanding. That That's, that's, it's telling you a mouthful. So this is what we got to do. This is the beginning of all things. So as we see the same thing with James chapter 1, verse 5, actually, it's right here. Because he's telling us, if ye lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men, liberally and unbraided not, and shall be given him. I'm telling you, boy, this mm, proverb is underscoring the spiritual wisdom and it's letting us know 
the more we seek this intellectual this intellectual knowledge is deep intimate understanding of God's ways the reflection of the heart that earnestly seeks God it requires humility, eagerness, sincere desire to know God's truth. It's right there in front of us. Right, in, right here in front of you. In fact, the same thing I tell people to do, oh, and you do me. You don't, you, you do me the same way because you got to test everything against, even what I say, you test everything against Scripture. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it, it, it conveys the same thing. You're going to see what the man with Thessalonica was doing. You watch what they're doing. In these, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. This is what I tell you. What, we, what I tell you, or what any one of us tell you, you go back and you search those scriptures. To make sure what we saying was true. You go back and check that. Because this verse is described right here. It's telling us. That when Paul was teaching. Unlike other communities. These people was eager to hear the word. They received the word with a readiness of mind. But they also searched the scriptures after he said it. They searched them daily. Whether they was actually so. Can they see it in the scriptures? Can they see it? That's why some preachers, the they, they preachers tell you, oh no, I ain't gonna lie to you. I, just, no, I, I tell you, no, I go, no, you check what I'm saying. You go check it. But the ones who don't want you to check it, them the liars, because they don't want, they want you to see it their way. When you should not accept anything that is told to you, search them. Search those scriptures. And see if they hold into a tradition of men or, 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 or the ways of God. I don't know. And this is what needs to happen. The pray, the, the, even the phrase readiness, the phrase readiness. Think about this. Readiness implies the same thing, the even willingness to learn a humility act. Open and receive an understanding yet coupled with this readiness of discerning spirit and with all diligence where you search in these scriptures daily, daily. This mirror are, are, are instructions to provide. Actually, we're going to tell you what. Let's just do this. We're going to look at something in um, First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter five. And um, we're going to look at this in verse 21. <clears throat> I'm not telling you anything wrong. It, it first Thessalonians chapter five, verse 20, it says, prove all things for that's a full thought. Prove all things. Hold fast, which is good. You see it in there. Okay. Yeah, it was good. All right. We cool. We, we can roll with him. So it's called to carefully examine, to test, to discern what is true and good. This echoes everything that we was talking about. Everything that we've been we've been discussing thus far. And we need to sit there and people shouldn't be all upset when you sitting there and you want to search the scriptures. They shouldn't do this. And you see this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. It's telling us the same identical thing. The same identical thing. It says, the simplest believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. I don't want the simple. I don't need the simple ones here. They'll believe everyone the doctor. I don't need them here. That's a waste of my time. Because somebody else can come with something that's saying something that they tickle their ears a little bit, they gone anyway. I want people where they, they sitting there, they want they want to search the scriptures. They want to search it, make sure what I'm saying is true. This is the catch. This is the difference. So this is the advice, not to believe every word or discernment, but you want to look for the path and you want to seek this wisdom in the scriptures. So the same thing as it's telling you in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, right over here, it says these were noble men than those in Thessalonica. 
and that they receive the word in all readiness. Same as I'm doing here. I'm doing the same thing. And search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So it's no issue with me. You can hear what I'm saying. Uh, he's talking good, but let me search. Oh, dang, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was dead. Okay, then I'm good. But you search him. You make sure what I'm saying is true. In John, um, John chapter 16, in, in verse 13, he tell you, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak for himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And ye shall show you things to come. Wow. He's saying, it right, he's saying it right here in front of you. Right here in front of you. you seeing it. So this promise of Yahweh, he's telling you about the Holy Spirit, this separated spirit will guide you to all truth. Will guide you to all truth when the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you to all truth. He should not speak of himself at all. He's not going to speak of himself. That's why you got these people, they got you praying to everybody. Doesn't make sense. But you see, John 6, 13, it paints the conforming picture of the Holy Spirit role of guiding us to all truth. It don't say, it don't say, how be it that the spirit of truth or, or Elder Johnson is to come. It don't say that. It's talking about the spirit of God. The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you. I'm just a servant. Look at me as flavor flavor. I'm just telling you what time it is. That's it. And he's going to guide you to all truth. He just need a vessel to, 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 to voice it to all his people. That's it. But this is what happens. So as it's guiding us, as followers of Christ, we believe this is the divine guidance in trusting our spirit in our spiritual journey to the Holy Spirit who reveals these truths beyond the human comprehension. The Holy Spirit is indeed our spiritual compass, our spiritual compass through this vast ocean of divine knowledge. So, however, the question always arises, if the Holy Spirit guides us to all truth, because people, I'm telling you, people are going to ask you all kinds of questions. Well, if the Holy Spirit guides you to all truth, and you have people who sit there and say they have all truth, then why do so many still do not even acknowledge the books like the Apocrypha as the divine revelations from God that men took out? You see how you're getting caught? This is what catches people. If they sitting there saying the Holy Spirit is guiding them, why in the world are they rolling with 66 book Bible? So that's letting you know the Holy Spirit wasn't with them. The Holy Spirit didn't tell them anything. Because they still been rolling with the same book, then the same thing is telling them the exact same thing. They got the middle part of the book out. But they saying the Holy Spirit is with them. How? It's not even whole. So why do some beliefs of Christ's nature continues despite certain biblical passages? In fact, let's look at something. I want to show you something. In uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1550. 1550, we're going to do something. 1550, he, he says this. He says, now this I say, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither do corruption inherit incorruption. We, we got that there. We got it there. Now, now this is the catch. This is a concept that people believe that this is Christian theology. People believe the concept. Yeah, I was, well, I ain't going to even use it. I, was, I ain't going to use it, the actual name. I'm going to use Jesus, the translated name. Uh, they say Jesus is the son of God, not the servant of God. And this is discussed in Christian theology. This is what's being discussed in Christian theology. Though we can find passages where it's telling you he's from the seed of David. 
we're going to see one here. We'll see it over here in Romans, and we'll see Romans 1, 3. And this is the trip. So th this tells you everything. But it tells you how how Christian theology is, 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 is trash. In Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Concerning the son of Yahweh Shadow Messiah, but 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 we say Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That shows you they don't know what they're talking about. Right here shows you. I can show you in other places. It, he even tells you out of his own mouth. Actually, I'm gonna put that way over here. I want you to see that way over here. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I just put that way over here just in case you don't know. Because he's telling you, I Jesus, I, Yahweh, who y'all been lying on, y'all been lying on me. Well, when I, he said, sent my angels, my messengers, to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. He's telling you out of his own mouth. I am the root and offspring of David in the bright morning star. He's telling you who he is. And people sit there, no, 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 he's this. But the problem is they don't understand scripture as a whole. So when we see this, this seed of David, it signifies one thing, that Yahweh or now Jesus was 100% a man from the lineage that tracks back to David, affirming his humanity altogether. Being titled the son of God, meaning the servant of God, it encapsulates that. That's all he was doing. But now to show you even more so in understanding, we're going to get something more. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. To show you even more. This is where they, they, they all mixed up again. Because now we can sit there and we can clearly get what's happening. Clearly get what's happening but show you where Christian faith is trash. It's telling you, it says, for unto us, each and every one of us, according to the flesh, a child, a child is born. This is clear. We can't get around this. For unto us, a child is born. But it also says, unto us, a son, capital, son is given, meaning this servant is given, meaning Christ, the spirit. And it says, and the government should be upon his shoulder, not the child, but the servant. His name should be called Wonderful. Who? Jehovah. Actually, let's do this again. Let's do, let's do some of this again. Because I know people are going to sit down. Oh, no, this and that. But, but just to make sure things is clear. It says, remember, God is my salvation. So this is is in God. It says, I will trust and not be afraid. This is in God. It says, for the Lord, the spirit of God, Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become. He became, he become my salvation. And this is who we call God. Jehovah, the word of God is who we Call God. Yeah, I prove the point. I prove the point because I'm telling you, this is the silliness that people get into. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, he tells us even about our forefathers. He said, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. This is how he came. He came in, he came in, the, in, the, in the form of a spirit. He, that's all he's saying. I appeared to them in the form of a spirit. That's all he was saying all together. But he said what? But he's saying this. He said, but by my name, he said, by his name, meaning by his way, Jehovah, I was not known to them. But just as I said, this is our God. This word. Don't, don't, this is, this is all God sent. God can't come down here where a bunch of sinful people like us is here. He can't come here. So we got to understand what he's saying. Let's look down here. Let's go. Let, no, 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 no. We're going down. So now we're going to look at this in verse seven and get a clear understanding of this Jehovah who I said, this is who we call God. He says, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. Now, if you don't like it, tear it out your Bible. If you don't like it, tear it out. And you go call Jesus 
your God. And, and, and when you go to hell, because he said he won't give his glory to no one. So when you go to hell, you know why you're there. But if you don't like it, that Jehovah is your God. Well, some people ain't, ain't, your, ain't your God know it. But anyway, <laughs> you thinking you following somebody else? I'm, not, I'm following. I'm following Jesus. Yeah, okay, keep thinking you following this man. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Because <laughs> it tells you that in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. That's why a lot of people go into hell. And deservingly so. Because all he told you to do is precept the Bible. But let's go, let's go on from this. Let's go on from here. So, the problem we have here is this. This question invites us to a deeper reflection, discernment, spiritual journey, urges us to approach our studies and scriptures. Are pursuant to this divine trust and this humility, our openness and sincere prayers of the Holy Spirit and guidance. So this is why I was saying that earlier. This is what I was getting to. Kind of got off, you know, sometimes I go off on a tangent. So y'all yeah, just pray for me. Just pray for me. Because I will go off on a tangent. But the main thing is, I will come back, but I will go off on a tangent. But we got to always avoid false prophets, teachings. He warns us about this. We always got to watch and make sure we be warned of these things. And most times we don't, but we got to make sure we watch them. And this is why he says this. And this is why I was saying this earlier about these spirits. It says, beloved, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, beloved, believe. And this is just telling you, beloved, mean promise one. This is a promise one. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirit. This is why I said you can hear what I'm saying, but go back and check it. Go back and check what I'm saying. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets, mouths of God are going out into the world. Many false ones is out there. Tons of them. Tons of them was out there. They're going to come home. Do you think Satan is going to come to you as a rough thing? The same as that one fool sitting there. Oh, hey, basically just a just a plum fool. A plum fool. And that's why I told him, just get rid. I don't have time to deal with idiots. That's something I don't have time to do. So when we see in this is what you're looking at. Don't believe every spirit, but try them. So the essence of discernment, pure doctrine is, is active, ongoing process. It involves careful examinations of scripture. The sincere pursuit of wisdom daily and you daily practice this in, in, in the reliance on the Holy Spirit in this vigilant against false doctrine, against false teachings. It helps us to preserve the purity of spiritual understanding. It is paramount that we remain vigilant. It's paramount. When we encounter teachings that seem contrary to the essence of the word. When it comes to understanding it. So in this journey of discernment, we must be cautious, not only over, 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 over you know, false prophets, but also to, to, to suitable distort doctrines and what that stems from them that they establish from their from they traditions, such as Christians and Jewish doctrines, they are clearly deviate from biblical precepts they clearly do this this is why it tells you right here in first john chapter 4 verse 1 but love believe not every spirit but try them that's why even i told a man don't look at the outer flesh look at what's in them i said this earlier look at what's inside of people because all you gotta do is look at the actions because many false ones is out there We have to understand a lot of this. We have to understand this. Purity, spiritual purity, understanding is paramount. I'm just telling you, just being right up front with you. So as we look at this verse, we understand that. And that same thing is we'll see something else. Um, and we'll look at something in uh, Isaiah. I want to show you something in Isaiah chapter eight. And we'll go to down to verse 20. And, and build on this. The law in to the testimony, if, meaning if they speak not according to this word, providing they speak not according to the word, 
it is because there is no light in them. It is what it is. They're going to sit there and they'll dazzle you with their words. They'll dazzle you with all this, that's right. They'll dazzle you with all these other things, but they'll never understand what the word of God is actually saying. They'll never be able to give you that. They'll never be able to tell you, oh, we got this about God and we got this, we, you know, we got the kingdom over here. We, we doing this, we doing that. Look how many people we got. We don't raise money for this. We didn't did this. We didn't did that. We didn't did all these things. Look at this. Look what we built. Look at this. We didn't build this. We didn't build that. We didn't build this. Let me show you what we building with the money that you giving us. We didn't did this. We didn't did. They're going to do all that. All these things. But he's saying, telling you, try the spirits. And it's telling you when, when they're sitting there telling you the truth, this is all they did. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. When they received word with all readiness of mind, they searched the scriptures daily, whether they were so. So the same thing is they didn't have to search it. Should we give this guy a hundred bucks or not? Cause he ain't talking about money. They searched the scriptures. He did say, give a thousand dollars to buy this piece of land. No, they searched the scriptures daily. It didn't say to give that, or give this. This is what I'm talking about. So we're being cautious of doctrines that deviate from Bible truth. That doesn't mean we reject them out of the hand, but rather we need to examine them carefully against the light of scripture and consider to be true studiers, as it's telling us in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. We got to search these scriptures daily verifying the same thing as Paul discernment of pure doctrine it isn't passive but no matter what they source is so we got to be conscious about this so we have to look at this against unshakable standards in the scriptures unshakable it calls for awareness and our own limitations and humility that keeps us open and divine wisdom and flowing from them, the fountainhead of God's word. So one of the main things we want to really pay attention to as we're winding down here, um, we're looking at Titus chapter 1 and, and 16, winding down on this. They profess they know God, but in works they deny him. We're going to check that. We want to we want to start ending the note on this here. In in this this similitude, this concept, this profound depth of it involves not merely intellectual understanding or acknowledging his existence, but it's a deep it's a deep intimate experimental relationship of knowledge. This knowledge signifies. The, uh, the commitment the commitment to um, oh thank you thank you this, this signifies our commitment and relationship and in, in, um, oh thanks okay oh thank you I'll put it here this um a commitment to really have a relationship marked with obedience and a shared purpose. So when we're looking at um, Titus 1.6, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and every good work reprobate. We see this. So this verse does a couple of things. It does a couple of things. This verse challenges us with the separation between profession and practice. It challenges us. We have to, we have to understand that all together between profession and practice between belief and behavior. You mark that. That's what this does. It's going to do this automatically with you. It's always going to put you between this verse with, with, with Titus one sixteen. It's going to push you between the, the main thing, profession and practice and between belief and behavior. On one level, many may comprehend the verse carnally as a critique to those 
who actions don't match their declaration of faith. It serves as a caution against hypocrisy. The danger of professing they know God, yet behaving in the ways that contradict his, his teachings. But we need to explore this verse on a deeper spiritual level to fully appreciate its significance. This, this, this is what God is all about. So spiritually, knowing God isn't just about a verbal declaration or, or, or intelligent or intellectual essence, but embracing in the embodiment of God, his values and our actions. It's about aligning our behavior with his will. In fact, um, we go to first John chapter two. I'm gonna go to first John chapter two. I want to show you that. First John two. Um, first John two four. We want this is this. This is what this is what I'm actually speaking of. He said that he know him, and keep not his commandments. He is a liar. And the truth is not any. Meaning, meaning, meaning this. You have many people going to sit there and tell you how much they know God. And they're going to tell you that, oh, I got the Holy Spirit. I got this. I have that. I have this. I have that. And they're going to do everything that they're saying. They're going to look like they know God. They dress really nice. They drive nice cars and everything. And they're going to profess they know God. But they don't keep the commandments of God. He's a liar. They speak the law and testimony. They speak not according to this word because there's no light in them. They profess they know God, but in works they deny. I'm talking, these are clear things. It's not nothing different than what we're doing. Furthermore, when we look at this verse, Titus refers to works. He referring to works. You see it that there, he says, but in works, but in works, they deny him, but in works. So you're doing something. It's not just a profession, which in Christian theology, they say, all you got to do is believe. But he said, but in works, they deny him. You see, you see how this is, you see this is not turning out good. So visible actions also underlying attitudes, motivations, intents of the heart fuel these actions. This verse speaks of, of being abominable, disobedient. Tells you right there, abominable and disobedient. Tells you this. For every good work, reprobate. So everything they're doing is reprobate. These terms encapsulates the life of not only the disobedient, that, that, that disobeys God's commandment, but it displays the dismissive attitude towards his will. Let's, let's, let's build on this a little bit. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, and we look at some of this. In 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thy own understanding. But that's something we we that's something we've been trained and trained and trained and trained to do. Why? Because men still want to sit there and they want to persuade you. With and, hey, what do you think? You say, well, no, I shouldn't. No, no, you tell me. Okay, no, no, don't go to the Bible. Tell me from yourself. You tell me what you think. This is what they're going to do to you. But it's telling you. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Spirit of God with all thy heart. Lean not into thy own understanding. And it's telling you right here, in all thy ways, so in all the ways that you do, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Why? Because he came here to be our God. He came here to be our guide. He came here to guide us to the path on where we need to go. He came here to do that. This is why we have to pay so much attention. Uh, so much attention. So your whole word came from your Howard and underscores the importance of relying not only on understanding our ways, but trusting in Jehovah's word, His wisdom, His guidance. We need to acknowledge God in all our ways, allowing Him to direct our paths. Understanding these scriptures depends on comprehension. It truly means to know God, 
not 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 superficial, normal acquaintance, but the intimate, active obedience and relationship with him, characterized by the works and align with his with his will and purpose. So, when when we live, we live out this understanding. Our works will affirm rather than than to deny our claim to knowing. So the only thing is we want to finish out on one piece and I want to make sure we understand it. Because one of the things is a question that we, we, we hit on earlier, but we want to we want to address it to make sure we don't leave no stone unturned. And I think that's only fair. So one of the things is, is how does the, 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 the concept of the understanding of the leaven that can apply to modern context so particularly regarding to a wide range of spiritual teachings, interpretations that can be available to us. How does the imagery, the imagery, 11, or a form understanding of sin influence in our lives, in our, in our communities? So when we're looking at the imagery of uh, 11, or yeast, often called today, you have both positive and you have negative ones. Most people don't know, but you got positive and negative ones of that. See, leaven, it works, it works silently, pervasively. Pervasively. Obscurely is what it's doing. It's referred to something that, that's present and prefer and it, it'll be found everywhere. But it's silent. Causing those to rise similarly to behaving with attitudes and belief, which can influence around us based on what you see or what people speak. And we see these things that are there, but 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 also it has a negative thing. So a negative sense leaven is symbolized by corruption. We see this. And in Galatians chapter five, looking at verse nine, we see it there. And what I said earlier, the same with what I'm saying, it's not changing, but people think this is where the, I'm I'm putting this there, but this was put in me by the word of God. So it's not these are not my thoughts or anything, but I but I agree with all these thoughts and I live those thoughts. And that's why when you hear me say it, it makes me sound like, oh man, this guy is really is on it. But no, I'm I'm telling you what the word of God is. And it tells you right here in Galatians chapter five, verse nine, little leaven leaven is the whole lump. So no matter what you might learn in the church or whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter. Just a little of it. Uh do the whole lump. A little leaven leaven is the whole lump. So even the smallest amount of sin. If it's left unchecked, it can permeate, it can corrupt the entire life or community, much like a bit of yeast that can cause the entire batch of dough to rise. Just a small piece. It's no difference. So today with this context, we this this is this is the plethora that we're looking at. The so-called spiritual teachings and interpretation of these metaphors of leaven urges us to exercise discernment. Discernment. It suggested that we should be vigilant about the ideas and influences we, we, we permit in our lives. Dude, this, this is, I'm talking about, I don't, you know, there's no other way to even say this stuff. Because even seemingly it mirrors uh, our, our, our incontinuous teachings. If false, it has a significant influence to corrupt and influence you. So for, you know, for the life that dependence on another man's table, it, it'll be counted for his life as not, actually, I'm to tell you what, <laughs> people might don't know, but I'm actually, most time I speak, I'm actually quoting Bible, but I'm, but besides that, I said, I started, I'm going to need to start doing that more. Um, in uh, Sirach chapter 11, uh, 34. 34. It's right here. Literally what I was getting ready to, to, literally what I'm getting ready to quote. It says, Receive a stranger into thy house, and he will disturb thee, and turn thee out of thy own. That is interesting. Why is this is interesting? Because it's going to get really, really interesting. The reason why this is actually saying this, and why it's getting into this, the, the, the life of him and of these men 
they depending on another man's table. Just emphasizing on what's going on. This is what's going on. Because most men or we rely on somebody else without being self-reliance. So the potential pitfalls and the dependency to understand the verse spiritually, one must also understand the concept of another man's table. So we need to consider it this way. We need to consider it certain ways. So the life of any man, man or woman, depends on another man's table. Saying this, they can be seen as living a life dependent upon another spiritual insight or doctrines. So as this person telling you these lies and all this stuff about their way and how you can get over all these things, they're telling you a lie, but you're depending on this man's table. Instead of seeking truth directly from the Holy Scriptures. So the table even spiritualized as spiritual food or teaching that being consumed. So dining on another man's table can simply imply the reliance of someone else's interpretations of Scripture. Instead of forming an understanding grounded in one's own diligent to study the word of God itself. This is our problem. So the same thing with the, with the symbol of flames, it polluted himself with another man's meat. Take, technically what it gets into. Seen as contaminating one's understanding or belief, a system flawed with interpretations of doctrines, truth, and scripture. So this, 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 this reprimand is the latter part of this verse. This reprimand is the latter part of the verse. So we got to understand this. In, in building back on that, um, we go back over here to Proverbs chapter 2. And still going right back to verse 6. The Lord giveth wisdom out of the mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. We can't, we can't, we can't get rid of this. The same with Acts chapter 17, verse 11. You can't get rid of this. Acts 17, verse 11. These men were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. We can't get rid of those. And, and, and when you want to see things a little bit clearer and have a better understanding on what, what I'm really trying to point you to, because it do have good connotations of this. And I want to show you that in Matthew. Matthew 13, 33. And we'll see it, we'll see it also there. Because this is a parable. And, but we want to understand the parable. And even tell you, another parable uh, spake he unto them, that the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened it. Meaning they didn't took the old, the middle, and the New Testament. The same thing. And and and, and they and they it's instilled in you and it it leavened the whole body with the word of God. Technically saying the same thing. Saying the same thing. So it depends on you. So the similitude even at eleven serves as a spiritual brahmometer prompting us to examine the influences and allowing us to live a potential lives and impact. It encourages us to, to discerning and to filter out false teachings and to embrace those who align with the principles and precepts of God's word. Leading a life that reflects the kingdom of heaven as we navigate the complexities of the world that so the wisdom, discernment, and being steadfast in commitment of truth. So with that, we're going to go over a couple of um, verses and then we're going to get ready to close out. But I want you to understand this and don't forget them. Because we're going to find out some things to help you, some keys to help for this spiritual purity that we're looking for. That each and every one of us need to have to get into the kingdom. In, in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 4, Understand 22 verse 4 I want to highlight. It tells us, By humility and fear, including fear, including the desire of the Lord, the Spirit of God, are riches, honor, and honor in life. 
We're going to keep that. The reason why humility forms the foundation for a healthy spiritual life is allowing us to recognize the need of divine guidance and opening us to wisdom of the scriptures. This is a good example of, of admitting when we are wrong, we're seeking forgiveness, even when it's difficult. So we need to keep that one. And when we're seeking some wisdom on that, we can build on that. We can look at Sirach. In Sirach 126, it'll help us out. And it's even highlighted. It says, if thou desire wisdom, so if you desire wisdom, keep the commandments. And the Lord, the Creator, shall give her, shall give you the spirit of, of his spirit unto thee. So if you if you do this for the Creator, that's the Creator right here. That's Yahweh. Shall give her. He's going to give you Yehovah unto thee. That's where that's going to happen. So seeking wisdom through 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 diligent study, understanding the scriptures is critical. So we might look and sit in the side, dedicating time each day. The same as you got to eat. You eat every day, but if you can't study the word every day, then you're wasting your time trying to get in the kingdom. Because the same way you eat, that's why he said, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm rain a certain rate of food every day to see whether they follow my law or no. The same you got to eat every day, the same that spirit need to eat every day. And if you can't feed that spirit every day, stop wasting your time. Change the channel, find somewhere else to go. You, well, I don't, need, I don't need to have this time to do it. Okay, then you, guess what? Then you're not trying to get in the kingdom. You're wasting time. Not only, not only your own time, you're wasting our time. So looking at that, we, 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 we build upon that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew 5, verse 8. He's telling you again as we're finishing it out. Blessed wisdom is given are the pure in heart. They shall see God. They are the ones going to see God. Keep that in mind. So what I'm saying is this all together in closing. As we see this path here. In Titus chapter 1 verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure and unto the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. This verse teaches us the internal lens of our belief, our attitudes, interpreting the world around us. So when we spiritually, with pure and guide with sincere faith, the seemingly ordinary events and elements in our daily life, we can take divine renaissance, revealing in this, this prevailing presence of God, contrasted in this mirror, some people disbelief. Look at something. I want to show you this before I go out. I want to show you something. Um, Sirach 318. In 318, right up here. I don't know why it's doing that. It says, The greater thou art in perfection and beauty, art in perfection and beauty, the more humble thyself. And thou shalt find favor before the Lord, before the Creator. Then that's when you're going to find it. That's when you're going to get it. But it gets better. Many are in a, are in a high place. In of renown, the famous. But mysteries are revealed to the meek. Many people sitting on high. You see them. I showed, I showed you some videos. Some. Many of them sitting in high places in renown. Meaning they're famous. They're famous for what they're doing. But. The mysteries of God is shown to the meek. The power of the, 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 the creator, this is the father. That's who he is right there. That's who he is right there. So the power of Yahweh is great. He is honored of the lowly. Exactly the point. So we got to remember these. And keep away from this last one. I'm going to use this one and then we're going to go out. I, I, I can actually talk on this for a minute. So we're going to go out. In 1830, because not, scripture is going to keep coming. And I just keep doing it. So let me stop. 1830, we're going to look. 
and it's going to say this to each and every one of us, this for all of us. Go not after thy lust, but reframe thyself from thy appetites. Yeah. Exactly the point. So with that, my brothers, I sit there and I, we understand what's happening here. We see what's going on. But our desires, our appetites, if unchecked, can lead us astray of our spiritual path. And self disciplines help us to control our desires, our spiritual journey. So our spiritual purity is not simply a state to be achieved by dynamic or ongoing process. It's about fostering a sincere, humble, loving, and disciplined relationship with God, continuously seeking his wisdom and living these principles in our daily lives. And these, these, these works guide our faith and wisdom and reflect uh, true knowledge of God and not mere words that we claim, but it aligns our hearts, our mind, our actions, our divine principles to where we can assure it's a purity our spiritual journey will deepen our relationship with God. So what I'm going to do, um, I, um, I have a, uh, one second, I want, same as I showed, um, I said earlier, most, most people know we do have the, um, actually if you haven't been there, we do have, you know, like we were saying, actually that was the wrong one I did, but that's okay, you can still see it. The main one is we have a Gospel Illustrated. So if you haven't signed up for Gospel Illustrated, you could sign up right now. You can go over there. All you do is give your email. You can sign up for Gospel Illustrated and become part of Gospel Illustrated. Where a lot of people, it's no different than Facebook. But you can come there and you can um, we you can share your thoughts. Your your you, right now we're doing these these um, exercises and you see a lot of people posting different pictures and some people commenting and some people are not. But mainly that's what it's for. And then one of the other ones is um, we do want to welcome that um, Brother Kermit Sampson is now one of the deacons over here. So we're looking for you guys to, um, and I need him to make some changes. So so he'll be okay. So when she come in, he'll be coming in to where he will be recognized as so. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up the Zoom for a minute, but I'm not going to be long because um I'm not feeling my best, but I do have class still going to be today, so y'all ain't getting out of that. We still doing class today, but 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 we but um the elders table I will not be doing because I'm I'm not feeling not feeling my best, but I don't need people to sit there to worry. Hey, how you fit? Well, I'm okay. I'm I'm gonna push through it. But but just letting you know, that's one reason why I'm not doing um elders table. So we're gonna pick the elders table up on another day. The class, we still gonna have today at three. And then, you know, if you refresh, you'll be able to see the um, the uh, Zoom link there. You'll be able to see that there, cause it's there. So if you refresh, you'll see it there. So we'll go back there, we'll take care of questions and all that. And just let my mom know, I just sent her the link to where she can, she won't have no problems to get in and everything. So with that, you know, we will be having class today, as normal. Um, but we're gonna come in the back area. We're gonna, gonna take care of any questions that need to be taken care of. And I already know that any um, any any other people that's new back there have any questions, you're more than welcome to come back and ask any questions. Cause I'm a once I go out, I am gonna let people know to um to um. Give me about just a couple of minutes, but but I will be back there. Just give me a couple of minutes to um to uh to just eat me something real quick, cause not 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 the best, but but it's everything's okay. And actually, I don't know why it's doing that. Oh, I know why I did that. Okay, but other than that, I wish each and every person um, later on for class. We will be going in there. So other than that each and every person until next time you, you if you want to join us in the zoom you can see the link down in the in the description right now so until then i say to each and every other person until next time shalom <laughs>